Oh 
your name on high. And if we didn't cry out, you say to rocks will. I thank you for this time and this place for where we can praise your name and sing songs about your son. We thank you for everything that you've done in our lives and here in this place. I just ask for you to speak to everyone who's here the way that you intend. And soften our hearts and minds as we just press into you. In Jesus' name, amen. Your love 
continuing uh, today in a message series uh, that we've been in that we've been calling Bless This Mess, and where we've been looking at really these eight revolutionary statements that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 5, known as the Beatitudes, where where Jesus standing on this hillside, he looks out amongst this crowd full of broken relationships and broken hearts and broken dreams, this crowd that knew firsthand what it was to be rejected, forgotten, and looked past. And to this crowd, to people who the religious of the day believed to be cursed, he looks at them and calls them blessed. Calls them blessed, not because of the situation they found themselves in, but because of what we find in him, especially in difficult times. The, the grace we find in him, the strength we find in him, the, the hope we find in him. As truth is, we're blessed not because we're living the good life, but because of the good news of Jesus. Come on, somebody. And so when Jesus speaks these beatitudes, really these blessings over them, in fact, that's what the word uh, beatitudes literally means. It means a series of blessings. Blessings not meant to be seen as some to-do list he's giving, like, like, do these eight things and you'll be blessed. (laughs) As much as really a pronouncement he's making, through this call to live out what he's already blessed you with. To live out what he's already blessed you with. It's interesting enough that the first half of these Beatitudes are really all about our relationship with God. Where in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, he starts it off by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. As it's here, we see him highlighting really the starting point of faith. This, and the starting point, really, when it comes to this relationship with Jesus, by understanding something we got to get, and that's that it's only when we get to the end of ourselves that God can begin to do a work in our lives. And so it all starts with confession, going on to say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, now again, this is not talking about grief over the loss of a loved one, but grief over our own sin, a grief that leads to repentance where we turn to God to do what we can't do on our own. And I love how how it describes God's response to us when we turn to him, when we look to him in our our, our time of desperation, our time of need, and finding ourselves not being met with judgment or condemnation, but comfort. Comfort. (laughs) Comfort through this forgiveness, grace, and acceptance that he welcomes us with when we run to him. And then from repentance, we we see this call to daily surrender. Where we're in verse 5, Jesus goes on to say, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. It's this ideal of strength under control, but not our control, but rather his. (laughs) And in this daily surrender, we're by hungering and thirsting for righteousness. By looking to him to not just help us to get through what we're going through, but to grow through it as well. It sets the stage for breakthrough in our life. 
through their breakthrough in our life. In fact, I think we've got a graphic here is that, that each of these beatitudes, they each build on each other. And, and truth is, listen, a breakthrough that I might add doesn't happen without really getting our hands a little dirty. As the reality is, if we hope to really live out what we've been blessed with, to see some of this grace, to see some of this joy, to see some of this freedom, to see some of this forgiveness, not just take root in our lives, but begin to bear fruit through our life. Bearing fruit even through that difficult relationship at work or, or maybe this overwhelming season that you find yourself in. It's going to require a willingness to embrace the messy. Often uncelebrated and inconvenient root work of routine. Root work of routine. And, and I wasn't expecting a lot of amens with that. But, but, it, it, but it's what's, what's needed. It's what's required. Because reality is, you don't get healthy fruit without deep roots. And you don't get deep roots without a healthy dose of the routine. As Look, I, I don't care how special your job is. For the most part, I think we could all agree that your job, if you really broke it down, is a series of routine tasks done over and over and over again. Like even this job. I work at trying to share something fresh and new with you each week from his word. And yet, while the content changes from weekend to weekend, if I'm being really transparent with you, you know the thing that never changes is the routine from week to week. <laughs> the, the routine of the message preparation from week to week. This routine of taking time in prayer. This routine of taking time getting in his word. This routine of, uh, of doing some topical research and then writing it down. Like there's nothing exciting. There's nothing flashy. There's nothing special about this. Like nobody cheers me on when I'm doing these things. Nobody sitting next to me at the coffee shop or when I'm in my devotional time at home and going, man, man, it's just... Man, did you see the way he highlighted that Bible verse? Like, that's amazing. Like, great job. Like, like, nobody's doing that. Because why would you cheer on something so routine, so basic? Dare I say, something that seems so ordinary, even common, because, because the routine in and of itself is not what's special. But rather, it's what that routine leads to that makes it impactful. As every once in a while, through this routine, I'll, I'll have someone come up to me and go, man, that that was the message I needed to hear. That was the word I needed to hear. See, see, I think for most people, they, they think that in order to get uncommon results, you have to do uncommon things. Where we're in trying to find a shortcut to success, we'll often hear things like, you got to do what's uncommon. You, you got to do what nobody else is doing or has ever done. And so, so say, say you want to do well financially. Like become wealthy overnight. Like what you got to do is you got to pick some uncommon numbers for that winning lottery ticket. That's what you got to do. Or if you really want to get rich quick, you got to get involved in crypto or, or get involved in some trade options or you know, make your, your investment portfolio, make it have greater variety or, or real estate. Get involved in real estate with a, some no money down program. But here's what I found fascinating, is that when you actually look at, at some of the, the wealthiest individuals in our, in our country, some of the studies done on how millionaires actually become millionaires, they found a commonality amongst these guys. And it was not in the uncommon things they did, but rather in the practices, the routines many of us would just describe as common. As in fact, in one a recent study I came across involving 10,000 millionaires that live that living in the U.S. within the study, some of these things that I found I found out about these millionaires were things like um, the majority of them graduated from a public school or university. Uh, it wasn't an Ivy League or some specialized private school. I also found that a majority of millionaires catch this use a written grocery list when shopping. It's like, I wonder how many of us would find some financial relief and freedom with that right there, <laughs> right? By writing down a list before we go to the store and, and rebuking the spirit of Costco, amen? <laughs> like, I can't tell you how many times like, I've gone into Costco without a list and uh, only to leave with a full grocery cart and an empty wallet. 
But here's another one. This one blew my mind. The majority of millionaires spend $200 or less eating out every month. Millionaires. Right? Like, maybe, that, maybe that's why we're not millionaires. It's because some of us, we spend that in a week. <laughs> But as hard as it is to believe that stat was, this one I I had to do some fact-checking on because I really struggled and had a hard time believing it was actually true. But but there were actually several studies, study after study that showed the same thing, that 93% of millionaires use coupons when shopping. Use coupons when shopping. Again, crazy, right? I always knew, Cynthia, well, yeah, I I knew you guys got a big treasure trove, you know, on the back there, so because... Cynthia is an amazing coupon shopper. And listen, I share all of that because what was at the root of their success? A willingness to do the routine. (laughs) To work at what others might just see as common or or mundane. And look, if you really want to begin to live out what God has blessed you with, it's going to take a willingness to work out what God is working in your life. It's why the Bible describes it like this is to work out your salvation, not work for it. We don't work to earn our salvation. It's a free gift. But we are called to work it out. What he's already blessed you with, to live out what he's already blessed you with. There's a great picture uh, that, that kind of speaks within this and it speaks to, to, to this willingness to, to, to work, to put the work into sometimes some things that, that, that might seem really routine on the surface. And it's in the story of a man in the Bible by the name of Naaman, who who suffered from a skin disease called leprosy. And of course, uh, if you've ever seen leprosy, I got the opportunity years ago in Tanzania to actually go to a leper um, colony. And and it's it's horrific, you know, when you see what this disease does, as it just kind of kills the nerves and kills the nerve endings. Sometimes it, you know, kind of reduces the blood flow to the point where, you know, these, you know, body parts start to decay and and ultimately start to, you know, lose their feeling, corrode, and, and even at times fall off. And so he goes to this prophet named Elisha at the time, and who he found out and, and heard about in Israel, and he, he asks, he's in, he's in a desperate situation. He asks for a miracle, and it's here in 2 Kings 5.10 that uh, check out the instructions he gives to Naaman. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Now, important to note that the numbers, especially in Hebrew, um, are, are symbolic. Like there's meaning to them. So, so when Elisha tells him to wash seven times, this was not like some number, random number that he pulled out of thin air. No, but this number seven is, is very symbolic and purposeful when it came to his instructions. As think about this, like, you know, and again, this is not like deep thought here, <laughs> but, but how many days are like in a week? Seven, right? How many days will be in next week? Seven. How many days will be in the week after that and the week after that? Seven. Because seven, especially in Hebrew culture, was seen as synonymous with a cycle, seen as connected with repetition and of doing something over and over and over again. And on top of this, when it came to Elisha's instructions to Naaman, he calls him to wash in the Jordan River. Now, the the Jordan River was also synonymous and known for something as well. And let's just say it wasn't for its pristine waters and its uh, tropical shorelines. (laughs) No, but truth is, even to this day, it's kind of a a dirty, messy, muddy river. (laughs) And not uncommon or differential from any other river in that area. Like there wasn't anything exceptionally special about this river or magical about its waters. In fact, it might help to explain why kind of part of Naaman's frustration in response. Verse 11, but Naaman went away angry and said, I, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord, his God. Wave his hand over the spot and, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. In other words, like, like, come on, Elisha. Like, really? I mean, if you're going to make me dip in some water, like, 
Like, why not the, the waters off the shores of Hawaii? Like, like something tropical and, and clean and beautiful or, or some magical spring somewhere. As what he was really saying here is, that's too common. That's too common. That, that's too routine. I, 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 I want the special thing to get special results. But it's not the special thing that gets special results, is it? It's a common thing that has an uncommon commitment to it. Let's take a look. So verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? I love that. As how many of us, we want God to do something big in our life. We want God to do the miraculous in our life, in our job situation, in our relationship situation, and yet struggle to see it ever happen because we're unwilling to take the small steps that look routine, mundane, or even ordinary. So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. He did this this very routine, common thing. Over and over again, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. See, here's what I'm trying to get you to see is that, and really the truth within this story, and simply this, is that it's not doing the uncommon things that lead to uncommon results. It's doing the common things in an uncommon way. Doing the common things in an uncommon way. As let's be honest, it's not uncommon to pray when you feel like you've got no other choice, Right? It's been said that there's no atheist in a foxhole. (laughs) But you know what is uncommon? Choosing to pray when you could choose to do a lot of other things in your morning. (laughs) Yeah, it's not uncommon to help out as someone who's easy to love. But you know what is uncommon? It's caring for someone who's hard to love. You got any hard to love people in your life? Not the time to elbow your spouse, right? (laughs) Who maybe it takes... Take some work to show patience to. Take some work to show grace to. Take some work to extend forgiveness to. Especially when it feels like you're having to do it time and time and time again. See, see, getting back to the Beatitudes and into this fifth revolutionary statement, I don't think it's by accident that that after laying all the groundwork, (laughs) that that when it comes to, to really rooting ourselves in Christ, that he says what he says next. Uh, Going on in verse 7 to say this, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Because let's be real, and maybe nothing testifies to the reality of God's work in our life than when it comes to loving those who at times feel like it's hard work to love. (laughs) As look, Look, but before I think we can really get into unpacking what mercy is, it might help by, by stating what it's not. Stating what it's not is maybe the best way I've heard mercy defined is this, is that while justice is getting what you deserve, a grace is getting what you don't deserve, mercy is about not getting what you do deserve. Not getting what you do deserve. And in fact, I like how James actually speaks into this in James chapter 2, verse 12. He says, speak and act as those who are, are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. And then he adds this this last part I love. He says, mercy triumphs over judgment. As, look, I want to share a message with you today of simply calling the mercy rule. The mercy rule. A title that I think hopefully will start to make some sense um, as we get into the context of this passage that we're going to spend a lot of our time in. And it's really these words that that James speaks in chapter 2 as we see him leading into this topic of mercy by addressing an issue that at first glance, I don't think many of us would see as much of an issue. <laughs> and yet in doing so, he gives us this call not to fall in love with doing commonly, common things in uncommon ways, but how in finding common ground, we're able to love in uncommon ways. We're able to love in uncommon ways. Check this out. Uh, James 2, starting in verse 1, says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. What? (laughs) Again, at first glance, can can we agree? It seems like such a strange setup and lead into talking about mercy. Like, what does favoritism have to do with any of this? 
And yet here's James. He's calling out these early believers on the thing that we all do, that we always do, don't we? And it's coming. How many of you would admit you play favorites in life? <laughs> I can tell you I do. I've got a favorite service. So is the one that is more responsive than the other ones. And actually laughs every once in a while at my corny jokes. I, I, have a, I have a favorite kid. Grant you, we only have one kid, so it's pretty easy to have a favorite there, but he's still my favorite. Most of you have a favorite place to sit when you come here, don't you? That let's be real, you, you don't choose based upon sound or, or because it's the quietest in the corner or view or anything like that, but because chances are you want to be closest to your favorites, your fave five. And it's not that you don't like everybody else, but again, we've all got favorites, <laughs> Maybe some week we'll actually like mix it up. We'll have like a James 2 like mix up weekend where we, everyone's got to sit in some other place. <laughs> that just makes me want to do it all the more. So, yeah. Um, but the, the, again, it's so what makes James issue with this. Again, at first glance, it seems a little much. Like especially in light of what he goes on to say next. In verse 8, he says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now, again, let's be honest. Who thinks James might be going a little extreme here? <laughs> like, it like, just sounds like a little much, James. I mean, come on. If you show favoritism, you've broken the whole law like murders? Like, what do, what do you do with that? As i, I got to be honest. I, I've never met up with a pastor friend of mine, and when they ask, how's it going? I've been like, i got to be honest with you. It's really tough. Like, I got some people who are showing favoritism and some serial killers. I feel like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I don't know which to deal with first. Like, <laughs> but here's why I believe this little thing is actually a big deal. It's not because of what it is, but what it reveals. It's not because of what it is, but what it reveals. It's safe to say the level of depravity requires for someone to commit murder. How many of you know it doesn't just happen overnight? <laughs> like, nobody jumps to murder from peace doesn't happen. You know, there's always kind of some, some levels of depravity within this, like, like anger and hostility and rage that have been built up with and, and undealt with over time. As to be clear, James is in no way saying that favoritism is just as bad as murder, but they do reveal the same thing and point to the same root issue. And that's that there's some areas of our lives that, that, that maybe, just maybe, we haven't fully accepted or even maybe fully trusted what God has done for us on the cross. Or to put it another way, you, you get it, but you don't really get it. You get it, but you don't really get it. Like, like you get it when it comes to the gospel message, especially if you've been around church for any length of time. Like, like, like we get it when it comes to what Jesus has done for you and for me on that cross. When, when by taking a punishment he didn't deserve, a beating he didn't deserve, a suffering on that cross he didn't deserve. He made a way for us to receive the gift of salvation we could never hope to deserve based on our own merits. And James goes, yeah, you, you get it, right? Like, like, you get it up here, but I'm not really sure you completely get it. <laughs> it's kind of like that moment where you sit down at the dentist chair, and while I understand the importance of flossing, when they go, when did you last floss? your teeth, and I say, when did you last floss my teeth? Like, again, it reveals how in our lives a, a person can get it, but, but not, not, not really fully get it. How I can get it up here, but not yet fully and completely get it in here. And this is the power of this passage in James. As he takes a seemingly little and significant thing, an issue of favoritism, and he goes, it's actually revealing of something much deeper in your heart. 
of a deeper root issue, especially when it comes to, to really receiving, living in and living out his grace and his mercy in our lives. Going on to say this about favoritism in verse four, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, now I know what some of you are thinking because I was thinking the first time when I read this is, how's favoritism judging? <laughs> Like, a judge, I thought judging was when I view myself better than somebody else. I thought judging is like when I pass that person in the car who's texting and glare at them, send them a kind of a you know, nonverbal message, like, how dare you? <laughs> like, how dare you? I would never. I mean, I would, but I would never make it that obvious. Right? <laughs> like, like, that's judging. But favoritism? I'm not putting anyone down. I'm I'm actually lifting them up, right? Not realizing that the truth is, you're still judging either way. You're still judging either way because when you do it this way, right? When you, when you do it this way, you're putting someone down to lift yourself up. You're putting someone down to lift yourself up. But when you do it like this, when you, when you, point, when you, when you put someone up in favoritism, you're still putting someone down, aren't you? See, see, you can't see. See, when I judge someone else negatively, I'm pressing them down to ultimately lift myself up. And I'm negating the truth that they were all equal and loved in the eyes of God, that we're equally valued in the eyes of our God. But when I show favoritism, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just doing it to myself. Who's the one I'm putting down in that moment? Ultimately, myself. I'm negating my value. I'm negating my worth as a child, as a son, as a daughter, as a, as a kid of the king, and, and my significance. But, but even more than that, what I'm, what I'm really doing in the same moment is, is the same thing these early believers were doing that James was trying to address. Is as they were showing favoritism, not because they, they liked these guys, these are these aristocrat guys because uh, something to understand a little bit about first century churches is oftentimes when they'd go into a synagogue or a place of meeting, there would be a curtain that would divide, divide the room between the guys and the ladies. <laughs> and, 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 and in the process, they also had front row seating for like the, the honorable mentions, <laughs> like the aristocrats, the, the wealthy, the, the ones of means. And so the, these guys, they would, they would come in and they would be, you know, sporting bling and, and all this stuff. In fact, uh, one uh, commentator said that uh, that was really custom at the time to, to wear as many as six rings on a finger. Talk about bling and really impractical. <laughs> but, and in fact, they actually had, back in the first century time, they actually had businesses that, that made a living off this very thing as they would rent out jewelry so people could make a great impression. <laughs> And so they'd come and they'd, they'd, they'd take these, these seats and, and take this like, you know, great, you know, places. And, and, and again, you know, as a result, you know, a lot of people, they would look to them. And again, why they showed favoritism wasn't so much that they liked hanging out with them, but they liked what they thought they could get from them. They liked what they thought they could get from them. See, they saw these guys as their way forward. They, they saw they, these guys as the way ahead, <laughs> in their life. See, what I'm trying to get you to see, this passage is not about favoritism. You know what this passage really is about? Misplaced faith. <laughs> Misplaced faith. But by looking to those around us as our source of advancement, as our source of promotion, uh, like, like it, the, the way to move forward, the way to get ahead, the, the way to advance is, is by looking to somebody else. By putting my faith and my trust in somebody else, what somebody else can do for me, rather than the God who says later, actually in James, those who humble themselves, I will lift you up. Who look to him, who, who put their faith and their trust in what God can and desires to do for you in your life. See, see this isn't about favoritism as much as about misplaced faith. In fact, I like how Samuel Johnson puts it. He says, he has this quote, he says, the true measure of a man is actually how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. What a great quote. What a great quote. And so when he, he parallels this, 
did this root issue to murder. <laughs> when he connects it to some of the, the, the worst things we could do or someone could do to us, he, he's not saying it's the same thing, but it's the same principle at work. As he starts to shift gears from who we play favorites with to try to move forward, hoping they'll advance us to, to this list of people who are, are less than our favorites. <laughs> and yet, again, same principle at work. As look, I wonder how many of us feel like we can't move forward. Now, not so much because we're waiting on what somebody can do for us, but we're stuck on what they did to us, what they said to us, how they wounded us, how they left us, how they hurt us, how they betrayed us. Feeling like I can't move forward without justice. I can't move forward until they pay. I, I can't move forward until I hear those words that I was wrong and you were right. I'm sorry. In fact, interesting enough, it's the same issue that, that, that we find Peter wrestling with and actually asking Jesus about. As he comes up to Jesus, and he's like, he's like Jesus, how many times must I forgive this guy? <laughs> like, like I, you know, he's bringing this issue up to Jesus. Yeah, there, there's some people in my life that have done me wrong, Jesus, that, that like, like wins enough, enough. Like, I get it. I'm supposed to love my enemies. I'm supposed to forgive, but, but I, you know, I get it, but I'm struggling to get it. <laughs> so how many times? Seven, which, which was more than twice the common amount that was given by Jewish law. Jewish law was three times, and it's like three strikes, and you're out. So Peter actually thought he was going above and beyond seven times, only for Jesus to go, no, not seven times, 70 times seven. In fact, I did the math on this. In the average lifespan, that would basically be the equivalent of forgiving somebody every three minutes. How tough would that be? <laughs> Talk about doing something over and over again. And so you can just imagine, no doubt he's looking at Peter, Peter's confused look on his face, like, like that's impossible. I can't do that. Like, like, Jesus, don't you know what they said? Don't you know what they did? And then he goes on to share the story, the, the parable of the unmerciful servant. Uh, the, the, this, this, this story of the, this king and, and this, you know, who calls into sort of account all these debts. And one kind of particular person who had this massive debt comes before the court of the king. And some scholars, you know, in talking about the, the amount that he owed this king, uh, equated to being like $8 million today. And for just the, this common, everyday guy who probably worked the night shift, like, like this was way more money than he'd ever see for probably his entire life. It was beyond what he could ever pay. It was beyond what he could ever do. And the king's like, it's time to pay up. <laughs> the account's due. He's like, I don't got it. And the king, talk about mercy, does, does for this guy something he, he didn't deserve. <laughs> talk about grace, you know, offering him this, this gift of, of just covering his debt, paying his debt. Because that, that debt, it just go away, like somebody's got to pay it. So the king, actually, he chose to, to pay the debt for this guy. Balance sheet even. Finished. All the red off, off the list. And so you're, you're thinking, oh, okay, this is a great story. He's going to walk out of there, man, celebrate, dance, you know, tell everyone, man, what, what an amazing king we've got. <laughs> what a good guy. Like, you're not going to believe all that he did for me, how he forgave me, the debt he forgave me. But that's not what happens, is it? Instead, he comes across someone who owed him a few bucks. And rather than, rather than showing him mercy, rather than showing him grace, rather than forgiving this debt, this tiny debt that this guy owed him, ends up turning around and basically accosting this guy, threatening him <laughs> that if he didn't pay him, he was, he was going to do harm to this guy. And, and, and I love this story because, again, the story, as it kind of goes on, like, um, I'd love to, to tell you it has, like, a happy ending. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that, that oh, okay, you know, it was a big misunderstanding and, 
And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I lost my mind for a moment. But that's not what happens. The king hears about this, calls him back in. His, his level of unforgiveness, it gets out. The, the servants tell him, tell the king what happened. And so he brings them in and he tells the servants, like hearing this, like, man, I, I forgave you this massive debt and you couldn't forgive this, this, this friend of yours, this guy in your life for this tiny little, this tiny little debt. And, and as a result, he orders his servants to drag him away, throw him in prison. A prison, mind you, of really of his own doing, of his own making. And of course, we're, that, that seems kind of harsh, like, 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 can't it have like a hallmark ending to this? <laughs> like, like just one big misunderstanding. Um, I remember some years ago, I came across a, a story uh, about sort of the original ending to the movie Snow White. And the, the original ending to Snow White, like we always think that it, you know, just original, the original design, the original script, you know, called for Prince Charming showing up, Snow White giving her a kiss and they live happily ever after. But the original ending actually to the story is actually one of unforgiveness. It's, it's actually ends with, with them bringing the queen in and really shaming her, piling on, making her pay for what she had done to Snow White. And yet Disney got a hold of this. Walt Disney heard about this and he asked them to, he made them basically change the ending because he understood something we got to get. And that is that you can't have a happy ending with unforgiveness, right? You can't have a happy ending, whether it's a Disney movie or it's the story of your life. And again, getting back to this story that Jesus tells, this is why I love it so much is because, again, it doesn't just shine a light on the problem and the issue of what unforgiveness does when we don't forgive and we don't let go of some of those things and, and show mercy to others, show grace to others. But it also gives us insight into how that actually happens, how we actually do that. See, this isn't just a story. It's really, it's really our story. See, in answer to, to Peter's question, how many times he's trying to get Peter to see that, listen, no one will ever owe you more than you owe God. You realize that? But because of that debt and because of the price he was willing to pay for that debt on the cross. And so Jesus' answer really to Peter's question, how many times do I forgive through this story is, well, depends. How, how many times have you hurt others, Peter? Uh, I mean, it all depends on that really, Peter. Like how many times have you lied to someone you cared about? How many times have you betrayed someone's trust? How many times have you turned your back on someone? And then he's like, hey, hey, let's, let's, let's get off you. Let, let's, turn it, let's turn it on me. Let's turn on me, Peter. How many times have you turned your back on me? How many times have, have you run away from me? How many times have you abandoned me? How many times have you been unfaithful to me? How many times? And you can just imagine this kind of internal dialogue that had to have been going through Peter's mind as he's listening to this story. And really Jesus' response to his question, thinking, yeah, a lot. A lot of times. See, the point of the story wasn't to simply highlight how unforgiveness really imprisons our lives. But again, it was to give some insight into how you break through unforgiveness and resentment and bitterness in your life. See, what I'm trying to get you to see, listen, forgiveness is not about forgetting what happened to you, but remembering what he did for you. And here's why this matters in relation to mercy. As you could really put it in other ways, that mercy is the fruit of a life rooted in God's amazing grace. Mercy is the fruit of a life rooted in God's amazing grace. It might help explain why, why, why Paul, when he's you know, really encouraging the early church in Ephesians, when they're going through hard time after hard time, he reminds them to stay planted, rooted in God's love. Because the only way you're not going to get stuck complaining about what they did to you or what they said to you, lose sight of the purpose that you've been called for, of sharing the hope and sharing the grace of Jesus to the world around. Now listen, if you stand firmly planted and rooted in God's amazing grace and love for you. 
Mercy is the fruit of a life rooted in God's amazing grace. That, listen, if you really want to break free from some of the bitterness and the resentment and the unforgiveness that's holding you back, it doesn't happen by just standing at the window waiting for that person to show up and say, you were right and I was wrong. It happens by choosing to look at the mirror and reflect on how much God has forgiven you. The debt he paid on the cross for you and for me. C.S. Lewis put it this way, to be a Christian literally means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in me. Because truth is, how many know, listen, we all deserve judgment. (laughs) When you really think about some of the things you've done, some of the things you've said, listen, we're all deserving of judgment. And yet we find a God in his goodness and his grace who extends mercy, who grafts us into his family, not not simply as spectators, but I love how that verse, that passage opens up in James 2 by calling us brothers and sisters. See, here's the truth. Look, we're we're all going to face judgment. (laughs) Well, one day we're all going to have to give an account of how we treated people and we either have to or get to when it's all said and done. We'll get the option of where we either have to give an account or we get to give an account. As look, can I tell you, as a pastor, one of my, my great fears and, and I guess struggles and is, is that in some way I would you know, allow or kind of coddle a life where you know, we would get it up here but not really get it in here. Because the truth is, is listen, it's possible to have a saved soul, but a wasted life. And look, the only way to really live out what God has blessed you with, the the grace that he's shown you to be able to show to somebody else, the mercy he's extended you to be able to show that to somebody else, is is being willing to get a little dirty, (laughs) to be rooted in Christ's love. To take the time to, to, to quit looking, well, they said this and they said that and, and waiting for them to come to you before you feel like you can move forward. But taking the time to instead look in the mirror and reflect on how much he's forgiven you, the extent and the distance he was willing to go for you. And not when you had your act all together and not because you were so amazing and you had things all you know, together in your life. But even in our brokenness, even in our mess, the Bible says while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. Paid a price you and I could never pay on our own. Extended mercy that we didn't deserve. So we could extend that same kind of mercy, that same kind of grace, the gospel message to the world around. Look, I want to pray for you today. Again, I wonder for some of us if the thing that's holding us back when it comes to, to our joy, when it comes to this freedom, when it comes to our purpose of, of being a light in a darkened world. So what, what, what if it's not, what if it wasn't really your boss? I, I know what they said to you wasn't right. What they did to you wasn't right. I, what, you don't know what my spouse did. You yeah. But listen, what, what, what if, what if the thing that's holding you back isn't that boss or that spouse or that angry neighbor? <laughs> listen, what, what if the thing that's holding you back? isn't isn't on waiting by a window for them to come and tell you how right you are and how wrong they were. What is actually holding you back is it's holding us back is us. And our inability to sometimes while we get it to not really get it. Because we've never taken the time to really just stop and to get rooted in his love and his grace for our lives. Take the time to do it before we start going and posting some Facebook post or or going on some rant. 
taking the time to first look in the mirror and think about all the times that God has shown mercy to us, forgiveness to us, grace to us. Because I'm telling you that when you really look into the face of all that he's forgiven you, I'm telling you, it changes how you see the world around you. It changes how you, you see that boss. It changes how you see your spouse. It changes how you see your relationships. And as a result, listen, listen, what you find is breakthrough. This breakthrough. And really, as you think about it, isn't that exactly what Jesus was getting at? He said, blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Because maybe, just maybe the hardest person to actually forgive and show mercy to isn't the person out there. But it's the person looking right back at you from that mirror. And when you really get into his word, you do the dirty work of getting rooted in his love through the truth of his word, communicating to him what you're going to find is that the truest thing about you is that you are loved with an unfailing love by God. That there is grace for you. There is mercy for you. There is forgiveness and ultimately freedom for you. Because it's not about what we've done or haven't done. It's all about what he did for us on that cross. So Jesus, we look to you. We surrender it all to you. Help give us the strength and the perspective to be able to live out what we've been blessed with because of your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Was about to lose my mind, but God came right on time. He made a way out no way. Yeah. And I thought it was the end, but he stepped in again and made a way. For every time they say God wanna gonna go through, I'd be a millionaire. Oh, uh, preach. If I had a dollar for every time they say God wanna gonna go through, I'd be a millionaire. Oh, uh, whoa, and my back against the wall, it looked impossible, but He made a way.